Hey everybody. Remember in our last lecture we were talking about continuous functions and we decided that uh, <clears throat> visually or graphically a continuous function is a function whose graphs have no breaks or interruptions. The graph is one connected piece. And we went about formulating this mathematically. And the first step that we took toward formulating continuous functions or continuity mathematically was to define the concept of a function f of x being continuous at a point. In this case, the point x equals c. And we said that the function f of x was continuous at the point C, if the limit of f of x as x approaches C is equal to f evaluated at C. And at the end of the last lecture, we saw what happens when this doesn't hold. When this condition doesn't hold, uh, there's always a break or an interruption in the graph right at the point x equals c. What this condition actually does, if it's satisfied, this condition actually guarantees that there is no break or interruption in the graph at the point x equals c. So if this condition doesn't hold, there's an interruption in the graph right at the point x equals c. If this condition does hold, there is no interruption or no break at the graph at the point x equals c. Now, having said this, I want to define what it means for a function to be not just continuous at a single point, but continuous at every point. And here's how we define that. So here it is. A function f of x is continuous if it's continuous at every single real number x equals c. So if it's continuous at every single value of x, then we just say that the function is continuous. When we say that the function f of x is continuous, we mean it's continuous for every value of x. And in this case, the graph of f of x has no breaks, no interruptions. And you know, maybe before I say this, I might as well say this.
Uh, maybe the function isn't continuous for every single real number x, but it may be continuous on some interval. On some interval on the x-axis, there are no breaks or interruptions. So we might cover this case too. Okay, I'm just covering my fanny here. Uh, a function may not be continuous for all real numbers x, but maybe we have an interval i. And on that interval, there are no breaks or interruptions in the graph because on this interval, the function is continuous at every point x equals c, where c is a point in that interval or C is any point in that interval. Okay, here's our next challenge. Here's our next challenge. How do we go about showing that a function f of x is continuous? And essentially this says, how do we go about showing that a function f of x is continuous at every point x equals c for all real numbers c? That's what it means for f of x to be continuous, right? If f of x is continuous, it's continuous at every point x equals c. How do we show that a function is continuous? Well, one thing that we could try to do is try to show that for every real number c, this condition holds. But... Uh, just exactly how many different real numbers C are there? Aren't there infinitely many real numbers C? So if we tried to show this for every single real number C, we'd never finish the task. We'd have to apply this test over and over and over again, infinitely many times. Uh, we wouldn't even finish the task of showing that one function is continuous. If we tried to show that even one function were continuous, using this definition alone and applying it to every real number C, we'd never finish the task. So that really makes this uh, a more intriguing question. How do we know, especially if we don't know what the graph of a function looks like, how do we know whether or not a function's continuous? Uh, we can't apply this to every single real value of C to show that the function's continuous. So how do we do it? And the answer is this. Uh, we're going to develop a, a small table of properties of continuous functions. And we might add to that table as we go on in the course. 
But this table of properties, and it's only a few, is going to be able to help, it's going to make us able to be able to determine whether commonly encountered functions are continuous or whether they're not. So without any further delay, let's write down the, this table of properties of continuous functions. Here's our table of properties of continuous functions. Just four properties. But these four properties will cover an awful lot of possibilities. Uh, the first property, all polynomials are continuous. Now, at this stage in our mathematical development, we have a pretty good idea uh, what a polynomial is. But I'm going to make sure after we consider all four things on this list that we know exactly what a polynomial is. And, you know, there's a really easy way uh, to define polynomial. So we're going to do that after we look at these four points. But the first point, all polynomials are continuous. And that's a biggie right there, because a lot of the functions that we work with are polynomials. So this covers an awful lot of possibilities right here. Uh, secondly, sine of x and cosine of x are continuous. Well, that's important. We work with sine and cosine quite a bit. And three, sums, differences, and products of continuous functions are continuous. So if we add a bunch of continuous functions together, we get another continuous function. Uh, if we subtract one continuous function from another, we get a continuous function. If we compute the product of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight continuous functions, we get a continuous function. And the last property, the quotient of continuous functions is continuous, except at any x value that causes division by zero. So we can take those x values that cause division by zero and in the interval between any two of those x values that cause division by zero, uh, let me be more precise, in the interval between any two successive x values that cause division by zero, the quotient is continuous. So, before we apply these, I did promise that I was going to define what a polynomial was. Now we have kind of, sort of, an idea of what a polynomial is, but I want to define it again and do it in such a way that it, it'll be a no-brainer for us. So we're going to talk about just exactly what a polynomial is. Okay. Our first step in defining polynomial is to define something called a monomial. A monomial in the variable x is an expression of the form c times x to the n power. So all monomials can be written in this form, where c is a real number, and the exponent n is a non-negative whole number. So let me highlight that. So all monomials can be written in this form, where C is a real number, and N is a non-negative whole number. 
So let's put some of these to the test. 3x to the ninth power. What do you think? Is it a monomial? Well, is 3 a real number? And 9? It's non-negative, and it's a whole number, right? So this definitely is a member of the monomial club. Uh, what about this thing? Uh, the exponent 3 is a non-negative whole number, so the exponent checks out. And what about this constant out front, 1 half? Well, let's see. C is a real number. There's nothing in the definition of monomial that says that this constant out front has to be a whole number. So, this checks out. One half is a real number. And uh, tell you what, let me add one more to the list. Negative a half x cubed. Well, this is sort of the same thing as this. Uh, the exponent is a non-negative whole number. And the, the coefficient out front, it's negative. But a lot of real numbers are negative, right? One half is a, a real number. Negative one half is a real number. So this expression is also a member of the monomial. Now, this one we might look at and say it's problematic. It's true, the coefficient out front is a real number. But do I have x to the power of a non-negative whole number? I don't see it here. But I could rewrite it that way, couldn't I? I could write this as 2x to the what power? The first power, that's right. So this really is a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. It checks out. Well, this checked out. This is a member of the monomial club. But what about this one? 2. Is 2 a member of the monomial club? If it is, then we're going to have to be able to write it as a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. I didn't say positive whole number, I said non-negative, non-negative whole number. Can I write 2 as a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number? Let me see. I think my constant, my coefficient, I'm going to keep that as 2. But what am I going to do about x to a power? Ah, I think some of you have figured it out. x to the power of 0, right? And now you're going to protest for a second and say, wait a minute, I thought the exponent had to be a non net Oh, it is a non-negative whole number, isn't it? And we know that x to the 0 power is 1. So 2, the constant 2, is a monomial. Because we can write it as a real number, 2, times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. So, hey, this guy has a membership card to the monomial club also. And what about 0? Well, I think some of us are probably seeing where this is going to go. 
if this is really a monomial, then we have to be able to write it as a real number times x to a power. And there are a few ways we can do this. See, 0 equals 0 times x to the 0. That's one way. It's a real number, 0. 0 is a real number. So it's a real number times x to the 0 power. x to the 0 power is 1. So 0 is a monomial. Now from these two examples, one that shows that 2 is a monomial and one that shows that 0 is a monomial, uh, what we find out, and I'll put this up here, any real number, is a monomial. So any real number is a monomial. 2, 0, negative 3 quarters, uh, pi. It's not a whole number, but it's a real number. Pi is a monomial. So all of these things All of these things over on the left-hand side are monomials. They pass the test. They can all be written as a constant, a real number constant, times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. Now, what about these guys? We have a real number out front. And then we have x to the power of a non-negative, whoops, the exponent's not non-negative. I mean, the exponent is, yeah, the exponent is not non-negative. So not a monomial. The exponent's negative. The exponent is not non-negative. So this guy is not a monomial. Now, what about this guy? We have a real number coefficient out front, and then we have x to the power of a non-negative whole number. Oops. That's not a whole number, is it? Well, here's another guy that gets excluded from the monomials club. Yeah, the exponent's not a whole number. So 4x to the 3 halves doesn't get to be part of the monomial club either. Two square root of x. Monomial or not monomial? If it's a monomial, we can write it as a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. So let's see. We say 2 equals, I'm sorry, 2 square root of x equals 2x to the 1 half, oops,
the exponent is not a whole number. Huh. So we can't write this thing as a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. So all of these guys failed the membership test. But that's okay. They can apply again in six months. So let's see. Not monomials. Well, let's see, I still haven't said what a polynomial is, have I? But, now that we know what a monomial is, defining a polynomial is the easiest thing in the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's so easy to do, even I can do it. And that's about what I'm, that's what I'm going to do next. How could this be any easier? A polynomial is the sum of one or more monomials. So take a single polynomial or more than one polynomial and add them together. We got ourselves a polynomial. So what about this? Well, let's see. Is this a monomial? Yep. 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 It's the sum of monomials, so it's a polynomial. What about that? Is that a monomial? Yep, it's a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. And this, is this a, polynomial, uh, a monomial? Yep, it's a real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number, x to the first. So this is a polynomial because it's the sum of two monomials. Okay, here we have one monomial. This is 2 times x to the first. A real number times x to the power of a non-negative whole number. But we only have one term. Is this a polynomial? And the answer is yes. A polynomial is the sum of one or more monomials. Uh, this doesn't look like much of a sum. We just have one term. But it is, it's a monomial. It's the sum of one monomial, so it's also a polynomial. And this thing, this is a real number. Remember, all real numbers are monomials, aren't they? And any monomial is also a polynomial. So, yep, that's a polynomial. Same thing here. This is a, a real number, and every real number is a monomial. And every monomial is a polynomial. So, all of these things on the left are monomials. Okay, what about this thing? Polynomial or not? If it is a polynomial, it has to be the sum of one or more monomials. And right now, I think I see the red flags going up. You're saying, whoops, that's not a monomial. It's not a monomial because the exponent is negative. A monomial has to have a non-negative whole number exponent. So this fails the test. It's not a polynomial. And what about this guy? 
these three terms look pretty good, but oh, we got a problem here. Again, square root of x, that's x to the 1 half. The exponent is not a whole number. So this one is not a monomial. And same thing here. Oops. Exponent is not a whole number. So these three fail the monomial test. They're going to lose their license for 30 days and pay a hefty fine. Uh, so those are not, whoops, 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 not polynomials. These three things are not polynomials because they're not strictly the sum of monomials. But each of these has a term that is not a monomial. Okay. Enough about polynomials and monomials. Without a shadow of a doubt, we know what a polynomial is, and we know what a polynomial is not. Uh, we know a polynomial when we see it, and when we see something that's not a polynomial, we know that too. So let's get back to the original objective here, which is to determine uh, pretty much by inspection whether a function is continuous or not. Okay, determine whether the following functions are continuous. And here's our first example. f of x equals 6x to the fifth minus 7x squared plus 2x plus 3. But what do you think? Continuous or not continuous? And if it is continuous, how can we justify our answer? Now, some of us are probably sitting there thinking, well, I know the answer, but there's got to be more to it than what I'm thinking. And maybe not. Maybe you have a real easy way to establish that this function is continuous. As a matter of fact, it's very easy to establish that this function is continuous. So easy that a lot of us are probably sitting there thinking, no, that, that, that can't be the right explanation. There, there's there's got to be more to it than that. Uh-uh. If you're sitting there looking at this and going, well, Dr. Rossi, it's a polynomial. And all polynomials are continuous, so it's got to be continuous. If that's what you're thinking, you're absolutely right. That's all that we need to say.
we're done. Now, wasn't that a lot easier than computing the limit as x approaches c of this function for every real number c and seeing if it's equal to f evaluated at that real number c? Hmm. That was easy. Okay. There, what about that one? f of x equals sine of x times cosine of x. If it is continuous, how do we show that? And if it's not continuous, uh, at what value does it fail to be continuous? Well, what do you think? The product of sine of x and cosine of x. Is it continuous or not? Now, those of you that had the right idea the first time, maybe uh, we can be a bit bolder this time. Uh, maybe we're pretty sure how to answer this. What do you think? Continuous or discontinuous? I'll tell you what I think. I think it's continuous, and I'm going to write that down. Whoops. Now, I got to be able to back this up. How do I confirm that this is a continuous function? And if you're thinking, well, sine is continuous and cosine is continuous. So this is the product of two continuous functions. And the product of continuous functions is continuous. Well, if that's what you're thinking, then you're absolutely right. You know, all of a sudden, that table of four properties of continuous functions is looking like a pretty powerful tool in our, our arsenal of weapons. Well, let's apply it again. Okay, uh, what are you thinking now? I can look at this as the sum of this thing. No, I can look at this as the difference of this thing and this thing. And what is this thing? A polynomial? And that's sine of x. Difference of two continuous functions, right? Okay. So my vote is continuous. Yeah. 
And my reason is, it's the difference of continuous functions And I'll say polynomial and sine of x. It's the difference of continuous functions, a polynomial and sine of x. And is therefore continuous. Oh my goodness, I was right. This really is so easy that even I can do it. It's uh, like the proverbial stealing of candy from a baby, uh, which is good because some things in math can be hard, so we don't really want to make things any harder than they have to be. And when there's a simple way of doing something, we really like it. Okay, maybe... Uh, I see in our future two more exercises just to make, no, no, I see two more exercises and then two more exercises after that, just to make our coverage of continuity complete. Okay, there's our next function. Continuous or not continuous? And probably all of us are looking at this table of four properties of continuous functions. And the last one says that the quotient of continuous functions is continuous, except at those x values that cause the denominator to be zero, or accept at those x values that cause division by zero. Based on that, and I'm going to have to explain myself a little bit, I'm going to say that this is continuous period the quotient of continuous functions cosine of x and a polynomial and I think there's an NO in there somewhere and I claim that the denominator is never zero. Now, I guess I'm going to have to back up this claim. And that there are a couple of ways that we can see this. 
Uh, we can see it logically. Uh, what happens if we take a positive number and multiply it by itself? Well, we have positive times positive. That's positive. Okay, what happens if we take a negative number and multiply it by itself? Well, we have a negative number times a negative number. That gives us a negative num a positive number. Negative times negative is positive. So if we take a positive number and square it, we get a positive number. If we take a negative number and square it, we get a positive number. And if we take zero and square it, we get zero. So what this tells us is that x squared can never be smaller than zero. And we know that. But I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me. x squared can never be smaller than zero. x squared is greater than or equal to zero. So if I add 5 to something that's greater than or equal to 0, I'm going to get something that's greater than or equal to 5, right? See? x squared greater than or equal to 0. So if I add 5 to both sides, I have that x squared plus 5 is greater than or equal to 5. This denominator can't be 0 because it's never less than 5. The denominator can't be 0. So that's a, an easy, common sense way of looking at it. Now there's another way of looking at it. Uh, we can take the denominator so this is 1x squared plus 0x plus 5 and plug the co well set it to 0 and plug the coefficients into the quadratic formula and we get negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4a C all over 2a and what that gives us is plus or minus the square root of negative 20 over 2. If we take the coefficients of a quadratic, plug them into the quadratic formula and we get a negative under the radical then there are no real numbers that will make this quadratic zero. If we take the coefficients, plug them into the quadratic formula, and we get a negative under the radical, then no real number will make this quadratic equal to zero. So that's the other way that we could have approached it. And I will say this, that we've probably been told that fact about the quadratic polynomials before. Uh, this would be a good time to file it away in our memory banks. Uh, we've finally seen an application of this, so now we have a reason to remember it. And the other line of reasoning that we use, namely that x squared is greater than or equal to zero, so x squared, uh, x squared plus 5 is greater than or equal to 5, and it can never be zero. Uh, that line of reasoning is also worth uh, remembering. Uh, another example. Oops. I know the denominator can be zero in this case. 
uh, and to find out the x values that make this zero, I'll just set the denominator to zero and solve for x. Oh my goodness, there are two values of x that make the denominator zero. So I can't really say that it's a continuous function. I'll write my comments first. This is the quotient of continuous functions cosine of x and the polynomial. and is therefore continuous except If those x values that cause division by zero, x equals plus or minus square root of five. Now, what I put in the parentheses here is not really my answer so much as a justification for the answer that I'm about to give. And I'm going to give a complete answer here. It's discontinuous at x equals negative square root of 5 and at x equals positive square root of 5. It's continuous everywhere else. So let's say from negative infinity all the way to the first x value, it's going to be continuous. And then from the first x value at which it's discontinuous to the next x value, it's going to be continuous. And then from the last x value to, continue, uh, to infinity, it's going to be continuous. So this is the way I want to answer that question. Is it continuous or discontinuous? Well, it's continuous at th these two x values, but it's continuous everywhere else. It's continuous from negative infinity all the way up until we reach this point, and it's not continuous at this point. But then after this point, it's continuous until we reach the next troublemaker. And it's not continuous at this point. But after we pass this point, it's continuous from after where, where this point is all the way to infinity. See how many examples? Five examples. Uh, we have four tools in our Properties of Continuous Functions toolbox. But with those four tools, we can inspect 
an incredible number of functions and just by inspection, figure out whether or not they're continuous or discontinuous. Now I have one more set of problems or exercises that I'd like to unleash on you. And then you will be very well prepared to do the next set of homework exercises. Okay, here's another kind of exercise that we need to see. And we really haven't done much with this kind of a function in class yet. As a matter of fact, the only time that we've seen uh, this kind of a function, which is called a piecewise function, is when we define the absolute value of x. And when I say a piecewise function, uh, essentially what that means is that the definition of the function of f of x changes depending on what the value of x is. For x less than 3, this is how we define f of x. For x equal 3, this is how we define f of x. For x greater than 3, this is how we define f of x. So the definition of f of x changes for values less than 3, for x equal 3, and values of x greater than 3. And we call this a piecewise function. Uh, most of you probably already know that, but some of us might not. Uh, when I went back to school and became a good student, uh, I could swear I had never heard of such a thing before. Uh, I had limited experience seeing this kind of a function, but I don't remember the expression piecewise function ever being used. Uh, so I appreciated it when my professor actually spelled it out. And I thought, okay, I've got to go look in a book and find out more about this thing. Well, what we're interested in is, is f of x continuous at the point x equal 3? So let's write down our plan of action. If f of x is continuous at x equal 3, then we have, but you know what? I can do better than this. I can do a little bit better than this. I can say it this way. This is our criterion for determining whether f of x is continuous at a point. And when we are dealing with piecewise functions and we want to know whether or not f of x is continuous at that value of x where the definition of f of x changes, we have to fall back on this definition. And I'm going to say that slowly because this really does bear repeating. If we're dealing with a piecewise function and we want to know whether f of x is continuous at a point or an x value where the definition of x changes 
then the way to determine continuity is to use the definition of continuous at a point, this criterion. And we want to know if f of x is continuous at the point x equal 3. And x equal 3 happens to be the x value where the definition of f of x changes. So we're going to have to use this definition. Now we know what f evaluated at 3 is, right? When x is 3, f of x is 6. So f evaluated at 3 is 6. What we don't know is what the limit of f of x is as x approaches 3. And since the definition of f of x changes right at x equal 3, we're going to have to look at the one-sided limits. The limit of x, uh, the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 will exist exactly when what? These two one-sided limits are equal, right? So that's what we have to look at. Limit as x approaches 3 from the left Okay, x is approaching 3 from the left. So here's 3, and x is to the left of 3. So is x greater than 3 or less than 3? If x is to the left of 3, then that means that x is less than 3, doesn't it? And if x is less than 3, how do we define f of x? f of x is defined as being x squared minus 3. This is the definition we have to use when x approaches 3 from the left. Now... Let's just plug in 3. No, no danger of dividing by 0, right? So we get 3 squared is 9, minus 3 is 6. Okay. So the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x is 6. Now we got to do the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the right. If x approaches 3 from the right, then that means that x is to the right of 3 on the number line. So if x is to the right of 3 on the number line, is x bigger than 3 or less than 3? x is bigger than 3, isn't it? So we write that down. x is greater than 3. And according to our definition of f of x, when x is greater than 3, f of x equals x plus 3. When x is greater than 3, f of x equals x plus 3. Oops. So we're computing the limit of x plus 3. And to evaluate this, we just plug in. And we get 6. One-sided limits are equal. The 
the limit exists. The limit is equal to the common value of the one-sided limits. So if the two one-sided limits are equal, then quote, the limit is equal to the common value of the one-sided limits. And I think we are ready to put the finishing touches on this example. I'm going to have to erase some of this. And here's what we have. Limit as x approaches 3 of f of x is equal to 6. That's what we just figured out. And we also observed earlier that f evaluated at 3 is 6. So that's important because it tells us that these two things are equal. The limit as x approaches 3 of f of x equals f evaluated at 3. This is the criterion that we had to check. Once we established that this was true, we knew that the function was continuous at x equal 3. Now, one more example, one more example. Okay, last example. Again, we're dealing with a piecewise function. The definition of f of x changes at x equal two. Here, we're told to determine whether f of x is continuous, period. They're not telling us to determine whether or not f of x is continuous at the point x equal 2. They're telling us to determine whether or not f of x is continuous, period. In other words, continuous for all values of x. So here's how we approach it. For x less than 2, this is how f of x is defined. For x less than 2, f of x is a polynomial, and it's continuous. Well, that was easy. Now, just a question. Technically, f of x equals x squared plus 4. For x less than and equal to 2, so why couldn't I say that f of x 
is continuous for x less than or equal to 2. And the reason is, is that the definition of f of x changes right here at x equal 2. And therefore, it opens up the possibility that the one-sided limits may not be equal. Because the definition of f of x changes right here at x equal 2, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left may not be equal to the limit as f of x, uh, as x approaches 2 from the right. We're going to have to check that case out separately. Now, for x greater than 2, f of x is a polynomial. The only x value that's in doubt is x equal 2. We're going to have to look at the one-sided limits. Limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left, is x bigger than 2 or less than 2? If x is to the left of 2, x is less than 2. So this is the definition of f of x that applies. x squared plus 4. And we just plug in. x squared is 4 plus 4 is 8. Okay, let's look at the other one-sided limit. Limit as x approaches 2 from the right as x approaches 2 from the right, x is to the right of 2 on the x-axis. So if x is to the right of 2, is x bigger than 2 or less than 2? X is bigger than 2, isn't it? So this is the definition of f of x that we use for x greater than 2. f of x equals 2x plus 2. And we plug in, we get 4 plus 2 is 6. Oops. One-sided limits aren't equal. That says something. It tells us the limit does not exist. That's what it tells us. Well, I think this is going to have serious consequences.
See, what does this tell us? It tells us the limit. The limit as x approaches 2 from either direction of f of x does not exist. And there are serious consequences to this. If these two things were equal, then f of x would be continuous at the point x equal 2. But these two things aren't equal. How can these things be equal when this thing, the limit, doesn't even exist? So this is our final therefore. f of x is not continuous at the point x equal 2. Now, we did see earlier that f of x was continuous for x less than 2. So that's the interval from negative infinity to 2. And earlier we did see that f of x was continuous for x greater than 2. So that's the interval from 2 to infinity f of x is continuous on these two intervals. But at this point, x equal 2, f of x is not continuous. Now, that finishes this exercise. Uh, but for the sake of uh, concept, suppose that we had discovered that the two one-sided limits were equal, and x, uh, f of x was continuous at x equal 2. Well, if f of x had been continuous at x equal 2, f of x would have been continuous for all x less than 2, for all x greater than 2, and for x equal 2 itself we would have been able to say that f of x was continuous for the entire set of real numbers from the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. So if f of x had been continuous at x equal to, this would have been continuous function, continuous for all values of x. The one-sided limits weren't equal, so f of x failed to be continuous right at x equal 2, where the definition of the function changed. Well, with pleasure, I am now going to assign you uh, the last set of homework exercises that will cover material that's going to be on test 1. We have to know this stuff for test 1.